if you're really meditating upon those scripture verses, if you're thinking to yourself, yeah, this is the way to please God. This is the way to show God I love him. This is the way to eternal life. Then if you're really thinking about it, you're really meditating upon it, you're feeling very uncomfortable. But you, because you know, ultimately, that you fall short of doing what God requires, of loving him in the ways that you're supposed to. And it breaks you up against that inability in you. And this is why Jesus is so important. And today we're going to look at our Lord Jesus, and we're going to think about how to love Jesus, how to love him as we are called to love him. Now, I don't know how many of you all know, but my wife has a Christian business she runs called Dwell Differently. She founded it with her sister, and essentially it is a Christian scripture memory business, and then they write uh, different little devotionals and try to help people dwell on the Lord and what the Lord says as opposed to all the things that we typically dwell upon, negative things. And, and so that's their aim. And it is a business. People make their living doing it, but it is also a ministry. And it has helped many people really spend time with the Lord and to grow in their relationship with Jesus. And so it's a beautiful thing. And I'm very proud of Natalie's work with Dwell Differently. Well, just last Sunday after the service, I was walking around our property. I go to my car and then I pick up trash because there's always trash to pick up in our yard here at the church. Sadly, I, I wish that weren't the case, but there's always some to pick up. So I'm picking it up and just throwing it away, just a little bit here and there. And, and I noticed Natalie was still in her car uh, looking at her phone. And so I thought, I got to I got to find out what this really pretty lady is doing on her phone. So I walked over to her window and she rolled it down and she took her phone and she showed it to me. She said, look at that. And so I looked at her phone and on it was a scripture memory business that was a lot like the Dwell Differently web page. In fact, when I really was starting to look at it closely, it had lifted things off of the Dwell Differently webpage and just taken them and put them up there for their business. And, and so they really had stolen the material from, from Dwell Differently, or they were trying to. And here's the kicker. When I looked at the name that was, of their business name that was on that webpage, it was Love Jesus. Love Jesus. Jesus. I just wonder, are you loving Jesus when you plagiarize somebody else's material? Are you loving Jesus when you steal someone else's ideas and their hard work, the things that they have created and produced, and really, in a sense, try to steal their livelihood so that you can make money? Is that loving Jesus? Now, I am obviously attached to this situation. But even if I weren't, it infuriates me when people pretend that they're loving Jesus, but do the very kinds of things that bring shame to his name. And it made me mad that this Love Jesus company had decided that they were going to try to steal from my wife's company. And, and to make a name for themselves. Today, as we finish 1 Thessalonians, it's a letter that Paul wrote to a church in Greece. As we, we finish this letter, and next week we'll begin the second letter he writes to the same church, but as we finish it, Paul wants you to consider what it really means to love Jesus. And this is how he ends his letter. He's like, you want to love Jesus? This is how you love Jesus. And so that's what we're going to think about today. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning in verse 12. Hear the word of God as it's recorded for us there. Paul writes, Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. 
hold them in the highest regard in love because of their work. Live in peace with each other. And we urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive. Encourage the disheartened. Help the weak. Be patient with everyone. Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God Himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. And then Paul concludes, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. This is God's word for God's people. Thanks be to God for it. Let's, let's pray together before we, before we begin to study God's word together. Heavenly Father, we ask for clarity of thought. We ask for hearts that are soft. And we ask as believers... If we are following Jesus, we ask that our faith in Christ would manifest itself in love and that our behaviors, the way that we live, would change accordingly and display the love of Jesus that we have. Turn our faith for Je in Jesus into love for Jesus and service to Jesus. It is in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Well, as we take in the final part of this letter, this first letter from Paul to this little church in Thessalonica, we're going to encounter three ways that Christians are called to behave, to live, in order to serve Jesus. And so here are the three ways we're going to look at, okay? Three things that we are supposed to do if we love Jesus. First, we show respect to love Jesus. We show respect if we want to love Jesus. Second, we do good to love Jesus. Uh, we seek good for people to love Jesus. And finally, we pursue God to love Jesus. Those are the three things I see here as you walk through this final passage. So show respect, do good, pursue God. And let's look at each of these and see what we can learn, see what God has to teach us. First of all, showing respect to love Jesus. Now, let me just say this. There are subjects when you're a pastor and you preach that are more difficult than other subjects to preach, okay, to teach about. So let me give you an example, right? Finances. Now, there are a bunch of passages in the Bible that talk about how God would have his people give sacrificially to the ministries of the church in order to support what he is doing. It is very clear in Scripture that God expects us to not just give our time and our energy, but our money to, to, to support the church. But what happens when I preach a message about how you guys need to give more? You need to sacrifice in your giving. What happens is those of you who don't like that message just go, well, of course, he just wants more money himself because my salary is all tied up with the giving that, that you do to the church. And so I can immediately be disqualified, in a sense, in your minds from preaching that message, even though it's, it's God's biblical truth. Well, this first thing is a lot like that. Because the first thing that Paul says you need to do if you're going to love Jesus is show respect to those who lead you to Jesus, to show respect for your pastors your elders, your leaders in the church. And so you could easily look at that and go, well, of course, Jason just wants us to listen to him, to do whatever he says. It's a self-serving message. 
Now, sadly, unfortunately, there have been many, many shepherds, many, many pastors, many, many elders and leaders in the church who have misused their authority, misused the power that they're given to, to serve themselves, to get people to do all kinds of things that they shouldn't do. That's a sad thing. And the Bible is super clear in the, both the Old Testament and the New Testament. God will not put up with that among his shepherds, among his leaders. Let me just give you a sense of what the Bible says as a warning to those kinds of leaders. Ezekiel chapter 34. Because my shepherds, God says, cared for themselves rather than for my flock, therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says. I am against the shepherds and will hold them accountable. A stern warning to those who are called to shepherd Israel. Or consider another passage, this time on the lips of Jesus. And for those people who think Jesus is all about like touchy-feely kindness, just listen to this stern warning. Jesus says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside you appear to be people righteous, but on the inside you are full of hypocrisy and wickedness. You snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? Talk about a stern warning to shepherds and to pastors. The Bible is very clear on two things here. One, there will be wolves among the sheep. There will be leaders who want to kind of get you to follow something that really benefits them. They're not thinking about God at all. And the other thing it's super clear about is that they will have to answer for that. That they will pay a price for leading God's people astray. But here's the thing. You're feeling real comfortable while I'm talking about shepherds and what they're called to, aren't you? This passage isn't about the shepherds. This isn't a passage saying, you know, shepherds, you better be careful. This is a passage for you. It's talking to you. That's what this text is all about. Inspired by the Holy Spirit, Paul wants you to know that even though there will be unfaithful shepherds at times, and even though the best pastors fall short at times, nevertheless, your calling is respect and honor and follow pastors as they are trying to all their heart and all their might to lead you to follow Jesus Christ. There is an authority not wrapped up in the pastor, but wrapped up in what they are doing. It's God's authority. And as I say the kinds of things that the Bible says, as I try to apply Scripture to you, it is not me who is speaking. It is not me who you are obeying. It is Christ Jesus. And so God says, you need to listen. You need to follow. Let me just read about some of the passages that say, hey, look, this is important that you would give some respect and follow after your leaders because it's not like this is just one passage right here that Paul mentions and it's like a one-off. This is repeated over and over and over again. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 17. Have confidence in your leaders and submit to their authority because they keep watch over you as those who must give an account. Do this so that their work will be a joy. Or, similar passage, 1 Timothy chapter 5. The elders or pastors who direct the affairs of the church well are worthy of double honor, especially those who work in preaching and teaching. So I could quote lots of other passages. I think you're starting to get the idea. It's almost like God looked into the future of the church and thought, you know what? Sheep bite. People who are trying to follow Jesus, they might push back against their pastors. It's almost that he looked at you and me and thought, these are sinners who need some pretty stern warnings that 
What the Bible says is important, and those who shepherd you in it deserve respect and honor because he knew that people would rebel against being led over and over again. I think that's what God saw, and I think that's why we get this kind of directive. If you want to love Jesus, then you need to honor and respect those who are trying to help you to love Jesus, who are taking their time and their energy to direct you to Christ and to direct you to his service. And so this is the first thing that Paul says. And let me just say this about me, okay? So we're talking generally about pastors, generally about elders, generally about leaders, but let me talk about me. First of all, I take the warning to pastors very seriously. And I take the responsibility to try to lead this church in the direction that the Bible points us very seriously. And so I do two things. The first thing I do is I try to follow Jesus myself. I have no business leading you to follow Jesus if I'm not following Jesus. So I try to follow Jesus. And the second thing I do is then I try to bring God's word every Sunday and whenever I'm with a group of believers to bear on your lives and to lead you to follow Jesus as well. That's what I'm trying to do. I ain't trying to get rich. If I was trying to get rich, I picked the wrong profession once and then I picked the wrong profession twice because I was a teacher in the public schools and now I'm a pastor. I'm not trying to get rich. But Jesus, if, he, if Jesus is who he said he was, if Jesus is God incarnate, there's nothing more important in the whole world that we follow him. We love him. We trust in him. And so that's why I'm doing what I'm doing. And that's what I want for you. And Jesus says, hey, as Jason is trying to lead you and he's following scriptures. Follow after him. Respect him. Don't make what I'm trying to do painful. Don't make me miserable. Make the work joyous for your shepherds and your pastors and your leaders in the church. Well, we need to move on to the next part, next passage. And I'm very thankful to move on to the next part and the next passage because I don't like talking about that kind of stuff. I don't want you to think that I'm all here, you know, just, hey, you guys need to give me authority. I can tell you whatever to, I want you to do, and you have to do it. That's not what I'm trying to do here, but I'm just trying to say, if you want to love Jesus, this is one of the things that Paul says you got to do. All right. Next, we've got to talk about doing good to love Jesus. After dealing with how we as Christians are supposed to treat those who are shepherding us, Paul moves on to the next arena of behavior which should characterize believers who love Jesus. Listen to what he says. He writes this, all about doing good. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone, make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. That's verse 14 and 15 of today's passage. This is where Paul steps into the interactions. He meddles in the interactions of everyday life for all of you if you're following Jesus. He says, you know what? Stealing someone's material for their business and trying to make your own business, you know, that's not good. And he says, here's actually some of the things you should do that, that is good. And this is how we're supposed to love Jesus. Now, all of those things he said were like, okay, yeah, I should do that, I should do that, I should do that. But... We need to clarify what he means by some of these things. And right now in our society, there is a mantra finding its way onto shirts, bumper stickers, signs. And I think it confuses us sometimes. So it, it is just two words, and you'll recognize this on shirts, bumper stickers, and signs, right? The two words that people everywhere, inside the church, outside the church, are, are saying is be kind. Have you heard that before? Be kind. That's all. And while I love uh, this idea more than I love most of the other dumb stuff that finds its way onto bumper stickers, I am suspicious that the person who has this on their bumper sticker, their shirt, or whatever, might have a very shallow idea of what it means to be kind. In other words, I think what oftentimes people who say this mean is always tell someone they're right. There's no place for coming to someone and saying, oh, you shouldn't be doing that. You should always affirm them. You should always tell them they're right. You should always say, good job, be kind. 
But I don't think that that fits with the biblical picture of kindness. The Bible puts meat on the bones of kindness in a little different way than that. And we catch a glimpse of it right here in this passage. The command to always strive to do good for each other and for everyone else could just as easily, from the Greek, be translated this way. Always strive to be kind to each other and to everyone else. But what does, according to Paul right here, that kind of kindness look like? Does it look like affirming and non-confrontation? No. It certainly doesn't. Kindness, according to Paul, according to Paul inspired by the Holy Spirit, according to God's Word, doing what is good, kindness, will often look like warning those people who are idle and who are flirting with sin and destruction. That's kindness. Now, I'm not being kind to a child that I see taking a metal wire and trying to stick it into a, an electrical outlet. I am not being kind to that child if I don't say anything at all to them. Or, God forbid, I affirm that decision by the child. That's not kindness at all, is it? No, that's, that is hating the child. That is willing destruction upon them and pain and suffering. That is not good at all. And in the same way, I'm not being kind if I'm silent or affirming when someone is flirting with sins, which ultimately separate them from Christ Jesus. That is not kindness. Just let them run into sins. It's not love. One pastor expressed this in a different way. I thought it was helpful, so I'm going to read it to you. He says this about being kind, loving someone, caring for them. He says, if we want to enjoy a lifetime of faith, so he's talking to you if you are a Christian, where the trajectory of that faith isn't a fall from early euphoria into apathy and malaise, but rather a rise into godly character and joy, then we must heed Jesus' warnings. And how does Jesus usher his warnings oftentimes? Isn't it through you and me? through an application of the Bible and the fellowship of the church. We must heed Christ's warnings and not only heed them, love them. Love his warnings, for they are warnings rooted in love. A warning, even a rebuke that is godly, is the most loving thing oftentimes we can do for somebody. The kindest thing. The best thing. And yet, we are told oftentimes in our society today that it is not a thing we should ever do. If someone warns you against sin, like I'm just going to speak to you, say you're the person who's getting warned. Do not despise them. Do not recoil from them. Do not get angry with them. But have an open mind, an open heart, and say, huh, is there truth there? Is it biblical truth? And then when you see that perhaps it is, and that person's warning you, thank them. Thank you for helping me see myself. Thank you for helping me to change so I can follow Jesus better. That is what the fellowship of the church is supposed to look like. That is doing good. That is kindness. It's not everybody staying in their own lane, never talking, never ever contradicting somebody. It is an application of God's holy word in the lives of the people that you love enough to confront them. You should thank somebody who's willing to confront you because they've done the hardest work of all. It's easy to affirm somebody, isn't it? It's hard to confront somebody. But that is the most loving thing oftentimes that we can do. The proverb gets it right when it teaches us better is open rebuke than hidden or unspoken love. The idea there is that Hidden or unspoken love isn't love at all. Right? Better open rebuke than that. Wounds from a friend, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. Our society needs to hear that today. An enemy multiplies kisses. Oh, you're doing just fine. Oh, there's nothing wrong with your life. Oh, that is sometimes the most terrible thing you can do to somebody who is running right into sin, running right away from God. And Christians need to take that more seriously. 
Well, I've been speaking for a long time now. We need to finish up here. So let's look at the last thing that Paul has to say in this letter. And it is essentially, if you want to do good, if you want to love Jesus, then pursue God. Pursue God if you want to love Jesus. Now, Natalie, my wife and I have had lots of opportunities to do premarital counseling. I don't know how many weddings I've done at this point in my career, but probably close to 40. And so you sit down with these folks and you do premarital counseling with them, which is an awesome time to say, okay, you're getting married, right? And everyone's like, yeah, we're so excited to get married. And you're like, okay, it's a beautiful thing. It's a great blessing. And they're always like, oh, we know, we know. And then you're like, and it's also really hard. And then they're like, what? Well, really? No, yeah, it's hard. So it's a good time to sit with them and go, marriage is beautiful, but it, it's good and, it, and it's sometimes really difficult and it can be like, oh man, what, I made a huge mistake. But faithfulness in marriage is important and pursuing your spouse is important. So one of the things we always say to folks, these couples that come to us, is we're like, hey, look, you're going to get into it 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, the whole time, whether you don't have kids, you do have kids, you're empty nesters, whatever it is, you have to pursue your love for the other person. Got to go on dates. Got to be romantic. Got to talk. Got to listen. And we always tell them that, right? And people are always nodding like, oh, yeah, that's so easy. And I'm like, when you got five kids, that ain't easy. I got five kids. It's not easy, right? When you're tired after a hard day of work, it ain't easy. When your spouse is saying things that you don't want to listen to, it, it's not easy. But we tell them that's how you pursue your spouse in love. It's more true even so with your relationship to God. What kind of relationship with God do you have if you're never, ever spending time with God? And I'm not just talking about on Sunday mornings. I mean, you don't have a very good marriage if the only time you talk to your spouse is on Sunday mornings. You don't have a very good relationship with God if you're like, I, I got my, you know, 10 cents of God this Sunday morning. Jason preached at me and I feel better and I'm going to walk away. No. I'm talking about every day. Cultivate your relationship with God. Pursue God. Kindle the fire of love for this glorious Savior, Jesus Christ, that we have. You want to you wanna love Jesus? You've got to spend time with Jesus. And that's exactly what Paul is telling the Thessalonians to do here at the end. What does he say? Verse 16. Rejoice always. Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all. Hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. And as if his instructions to do this, to pursue Jesus, to pursue God wasn't enough. You know what he does? He then just breaks out in prayer. Paul does this all the time. In the middle of his letter, he just starts praying for the Thessalonians. He does the very thing himself that he's telling them to do. And he cries out to God for them. Because Paul was somebody who kindled constantly that fire of love for Jesus and for God. He had to because his ministry was brutally difficult. But he was in love with God. And he longed that the church, this Thessalonian church, but every church, would love Jesus like he loved Jesus. Friends, to love Jesus well, we have to spend time with Jesus, not just on Sunday mornings, not just whenever you feel like it, but regularly. It's hard work, but you've got to do it. I, you know, they say that couples, and I think, I don't, this scares me because I think my wife is beautiful, but, you know, and I'm not that, I, 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 don't, I don't really consider myself to be that attractive. So they say couples start to look like each other throughout the course of a marriage. I'm like, I don't want her to look like me. Hopefully I look more, you know, like she's pretty, but anyway. They say that. They also say that, like, Dogs and their owners start to look like each other. Have you heard that? You've heard this, right? Like, and I, we, we live on Hazleton. These people walk by with their dogs all the time. I'm like, that's true. That person does look like their basset hound. You know, it's like, it's, it's crazy. Well, they say that. He, here's, here's the truth behind all that. If you spend time with somebody, you do start to, to look like them or to sound like them. Or, and that's our hope with Jesus. 
that you will spend time with Jesus, your Savior. And over that time, you will begin to look more and more like him to the glory of God. Amen? Amen. That's what we want. I want to look more like Jesus, less like Jason. He must become more. He must become greater. I must become less. Amen. Let's pray. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these concluding remarks in 1 Thessalonians, and we thank you for the call to kindness, a robust, healthy kindness, and a respect for the leaders of the church so that we might together in unity pursue Jesus Christ. And ultimately, we thank you that you call us into your presence and you're willing to spend time with us. And we ask that we as a people here at Central Church would continue to look more and more like our Savior, Jesus Christ, because we love him and we spend time with him. It is in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen.